Okay, hey everyone, it is 3.30, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone so much for joining us today for Direct Connect. Uh, my name is Madeline Zlinski. I'm with Youth Moves National, and we'll be presenting about building youth leadership capacity um, with Johanna Bergen, who's also from Youth Move. So Direct Connect is part of a, a learning community hosted by Nas uh, Youth Move National in partnership with the TA Network um, and operated with uh, coordination through University of Maryland. Today, we are really excited to um, cover a number of things. So I wanted to get started with everyone in terms of sharing the context of Direct Connect and how we approach uh, this learning space with all of you. Um, our goal with this bi-monthly series is to help each of us develop our professional skill sets uh, through virtual training, uh, like this webinar. Um, our second goal is to connect each other as a community, so learning and sharing um, what good work is happening in other communities across the country, and generally uniting youth advocates and professional peers uh, working within the youth movement across the country. Uh, many of you are joining from system of care communities, youth move chapters and other youth run organizations. And our goal is for us all to feel um, more in this work together uh, than apart. So we would love to know who is in the audience today. Um, so if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us your name, role, let us know where you're calling from. And um, our icebreaker today is what was a time that you felt like a leader? So go ahead and use the chat box to share that, um, those answers. Thanks, everybody, for jumping right there in there and typing hello to those of you that have already said hello. And let us know where you're from. On our end as facilitators of this, um, of this webinar, we just hear, see multiple attendees are typing, which is always exciting to be like, who's going to be here and say hello? We have Joseph May joining us from Anderson, Indiana, Madison County. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, Joseph. We also have Catherine, who is a wraparound youth support partner with Boulder County Impact in Boulder, Colorado. We have Tracy, who works with the Department of Health and Human Services in Denver. Awesome. Thank you all for introducing yourselves and jumping right in there. I'm excited for people to be brave and share their responses to our opening discussion question, when was a time that you have felt like a leader? And Madeline and I are going to share in a little bit as well. So Brandon from Kentucky says, the first time I felt like a leader uh, was during my time on Kentucky Youth Move. We partnered with people from the Department of Behavioral Health to get peer support, Medicaid, billable. Huge success and very empowering. That's awesome, Brandon. That actually is a really huge achievement. Nice work. All right, Madeline, what about giving folks some time to continue to type in and we can circle back and around as we do our introductions as well? 
Sounds good. All right. Oh yeah. See, I just had to say that, and everybody got excited about <laughs> about sharing. Um, so as you guys keep talking and responding to the question of when you first felt like you were a leader, um, we're going to go through another slide and then do our introductions as well. Um, so today's specific Direct Connect, we have a few learning objectives. Um, and I'll give you this framework so you know where we're going to go and the content we're going to cover in the next 90 minutes or so. Um, our first learning objective is to identify the role culture plays in the development of our own a unique and individual leadership style and really drive home that connection between culture and leadership. We're going to spend some time talking about how to manage complex change. Um, and we're going to break apart complex change initiatives into a number of components, um, hopefully in a way that makes it really um, manageable and helpful for you to um, take those components and work on one or more of them in the change work you're doing in your community. We're going to spend a little time exploring the ladder of inference um, and, again, how that uh, applies and plays out in our own leadership journeys. Um, and our goal is that you leave the, today's session with um, one or more tangible skills, things that you can turn around and use right away um, in your youth engagement and youth voice work. Um, so as I said before, my name is Johanna. Um, I live and work in Iowa, uh, so that's where I am geographically right now. Um, and I really appreciate um, Maddie asking us this question of when is the first time um, we felt like a leader. Um, when I reflect on this question, um, I, I remember very clearly a specific situation. Um, I grew up uh, in 4-H. It was a big part of my life. Um, and when I was in late middle school, my club elected me to be one of the elected leadership um, offices in our 4-H club. And I just remember being totally surprised and amazed um, that other people thought that I was capable um, to do that role and that work. Um, I was a whole lot shyer and less talkative than I am now. Um, and I let that sort of translate into um, not being a leader and being a follower. Um, and as I reflect on that first time of feeling like a leader, I realized that a lot of my leadership journey uh, involves um, external validation, other people telling me that they saw me as a leader. Um, and so a really big, important part of my leadership journey um, is, uh, was and is in an ongoing way owning that I feel like a leader myself um, in all of the work that I do. So thanks for a good question, Maddie. And I'll toss it over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I feel like the first time that I felt like a leader, I think about um, my friend and I used to throw costume parties. Um, and we would love getting dressed up, and I think what I really liked about having those parties was that it would, I could see other people, like, try to come out of their shells and expand and, like, see what creative things they could come up with, um, and then also to see them connect with other people in the community that maybe they weren't, wouldn't have connected with before, um, and sort of see the, my friends build their social systems um, through coming together in this creative way and giving people something to bond over. Um, so that's the first time that I really felt like a leader, and I feel like I kind of continue to um, to have that sort of try to take those lessons with me in the work I do now. Um, so we have some answers in the chat box. Um, Marquisha says that I felt like a leader when um, when we were organizing, uh, working on organizing a retreat for youth and families. Um, that is a huge task to take on, so nice work with your leadership. Marquisha was also felt like a leader the first time she was asked to teach Sunday school. Awesome. That's a great task. So um, the first part of our webinar today, we're going to talk about uh, what is leadership. So we have this quote for you that says, leadership is a process of social influence, which maximizes the efforts of others towards the achievement of a goal. So we would love to hear back from you all and think, um, what does this quote make you think? Um, what sort of ideas does this give you in reflections about leadership? And feel free to share those things in the chat box. Hmm. 
Maddie, one of the things I love about this definition of leadership is the part about maximizing the efforts of others, right? Um, I think sometimes we think about leadership as a thing one person does, uh, and this particular definition um, emphasizes something that's important to me, right, that we're, we're in this together. Um, uh, there's, a, there's an us factor to leadership. Absolutely. It sometimes seems like leadership is more about helping others to achieve than it is about your own achievements. Put that on a bumper sticker. Right. Well, we have some people typing, so um, thank you all for sharing your thoughts in there. We'll read those as those come up. It's a shout out to Christine joining us from Oklahoma. I think we missed saying hello to her. Um, and Joseph sharing about some of his leadership in um, participation in uh, community and system of care meetings. I'd be curious, um, as folks are thinking and reflecting on uh, this definition of leadership, um, throughout the session, I would be really interested if there are other definitions of leadership you use in your, um, in your personal work or in your community work. Um, I feel like leadership definitions are fun to collect and analyze. Um, Marquisha says that I feel like it inspires others to bring their thoughts and abilities to the table and reach a common goal of the group. Excellent reflection. Thanks for sharing that. We have a couple other comments. We have Rosiris. First time I felt like a leader was when I participated in a group supervision and I was able to help my coworker with information about resources. Awesome. It's great to feel like you can be helpful as a peer. Tracy says that uh, leaders surround themselves with others who may have different skill sets and find a way to highlight how these different skills can achieve a goal. That is so true. We all um, have our own capacity, and to be able to surround yourself with people with different talents makes tasks so much easier. Brandon says, for me, it's finding strengths from other team members, helping them tap into those strengths, Sometimes they may have strengths that they don't know, and that's okay. That's why working on a team is great, to use strengths collectively towards the goal. We've got some new leadership um, definitions for you, Johanna. I love it. <laughs> Joseph says that leadership is about having a vision that you can get others to get behind. Absolutely. Oh, I'm so with you, Joseph. Yeah, I think that this definition on the screen, that sort of the achievement of a goal, the last phrase, um, means vision, right? Um, I think it would be cooler if the word vision was actually in there. Knowing where you're going is so important. Absolutely. Okay, so we, um, one important part of being a leader is knowing who you are in the work. So we, one of the most important things about who we are is our culture, um, where we come from. So we're going to talk about what is culture. So we have a definition here that says culture is shared patterns of behaviors and interactions, thoughts, and beliefs and practices that are learned through a process of socialization. So that basically means culture is the things that you learn through growing up, you know, through your family, through where you live. Um, we have this wonderful diagram over here that sort of has different sections that are the things that make up your culture, um, whether it's your customs, beliefs, uh, language, or the food that you eat. All these things are part of your culture, and they make who we are.
we use this wonderful metaphor for culture, um, which is the iceberg. And people sort of understand an iceberg as, you know, you can only see the top 10% of it. And that's what culture is like as well. There's the culture that we can see when someone's walking down the street or that's surface level. Um, but then there's also the unseen and deep culture. These are things that maybe you might not see just from looking at someone, um, that unseen culture. There also is a deep culture, which are things that maybe you wouldn't even know about a culture unless you're part of it. Things like um, ingrained beliefs that are like generational trauma can be part of someone's deep culture. So we have some discussion points here, and we want to hear um, what can people tell about you from meeting you, it's sort of the surface level culture. So what cultural things can people um, take away just by sort of uh, meeting you, looking at you, talking with you, having a conversation? We also have um, a prompt about, you know, what are important parts of your culture? What are the parts of your culture that are the most meaningful for you? Um, and if you would like to share in the chat box, we would love to hear about something that's important to your culture that maybe others can't see just from looking at you. It's part of your unseen culture. Maddie, maybe we can talk a little bit about our own culture um, as folks type into the chat box. Um, I'm realizing more and more these days that um, I'm out in my community a lot with my children. So I have two children. And so people know from a distance, um, as soon as they see me, that I'm a mom, right? That's something that is um, easy to tell about me um, just upon sight. I also drink copious amounts of coffee. Do you think that's a part of my culture? It's got to be. Maybe, <laughs> maybe part of your work culture. <laughs> totally. I, and I feel yeah, called to share it with you guys today because you can't see me clutching my coffee mug right now. <laughs> and I think that um, what you eat and drink is like the most important part maybe of, of my culture or it's an important part of where I come from because that's sort of like um, where you bond with your family and um, how you learn things and learn about the world and um, also taking care of yourself. Oh, I love that reflection, Maddie, because you are someone on our team who is always providing advice or ideas about what other people should be eating or telling us about what you eat when you travel. It's cool to hear you I, say that out loud. I do love food. I had some awesome muscles the other night. <laughs> so, Johanna, what is something about your culture that others can't see? Oh, gosh. I mean, so much, right? Like, I think we can only... Just like the iceberg that you shared with us, like what you can see is so little. Um, I think one of the things that's really important to me is that I, I grew up in I grew up in Iowa in a very rural um, small town, and things like um, work ethic and um, uh, my sort of responsibility both to like land and family and my community are a huge part of who I am um, at work and with my friends and with my family. Um, and that's something that I have to say out loud or share through a story or a reflection. Um, it's not something someone knows about me um, if they meet me at a meeting somewhere. Excellent answer. Yeah, that one's hard to think of. We still have some people typing, so we'll give you guys a second to share some um, things about your culture with us. Maddie, what's something that's easy to see about your culture when someone meets you and something that is harder to see? Um, well, I think that the easiest thing to see is um, my appearance. I wear a lot of sweatpants, and I don't really put a lot of effort into, like, um, like my appearance when I leave the house and stuff because I feel like, the culture that I come from puts so much more value on the way that you live and the work that you do and that being sort of like what you show for yourself and not so much like your physical appearance. Um, 
So I don't know if everyone would interpret it that way when they see that, but that might be the unseen part of it, um, that they might think, oh, she's just lazy and she doesn't want to put on makeup, but really it's because, um, you know, the work is more important or what I'm doing is more important than the outward perception of, like, um, like being well-dressed or something like that. Yeah, so there is something easy to see, but, like, the interpretation of it actually matters a lot more to who you are and your culture um, than might be perceived. So we have some people responding in the chat box. Jewel says that people can tell that I'm a woman, but over 50% of people don't see that I'm both Latina and white. I'm the daughter of an immigrant from Latin America. Most people can't tell that when they meet me or even when they meet my parents because I don't look like them. However, it's a huge part of who I am. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, that's a, that's, um, that's a really good example of culture playing out in um, what's easy to see and, and a lot of deepness there. Thanks, Jules. Catherine says, I have visible tattoos, which people see right after meeting me. I think that allows people to make assumptions about my culture. I am a mom, and that is an important part of my culture. So true. And you can be a mom and have tattoos. Not everyone knows that. Uh, Marquisha says, they can tell that I am a people person, important parts, and family. Absolutely. And I think maybe, Marquisha, because you're so close with your family, that helps people tell that you're, such a, that you're a people person. Joseph says, just being myself and having people connect with me and genuinely wanting to help people by being professional. Awesome. I know we're not going to tip into values too much here, but so many of you are expressing in these unseen parts of your culture the, the, the things that you value, right? Connection, uh, relationships with people. Um, yeah, that's really cool. Awesome, so feel free to keep sharing. We're gonna keep um, the discussion going. We have this, um, we're bringing the iceberg back. So we have um, some visible and deep culture things labeled here for you to give you a better idea about what sort of things might fall into those. Um, so our visible culture are things like um, food or music, um, literature and games, and maybe the way you present yourself. So. Um, so we can see the arts of another culture that's visible. Like, you know, we can experience their food. Um, and then there's deeper culture, things that we might not see and may have to do with everyday interactions for cultures that we're not a part of, like um, their values, like Johanna mentioned, uh, maybe etiquette, or how you're supposed to behave. There's lots of different cultures that have um, the nature of their friendship is different or their gender roles are different. And then the deeper you go in this iceberg, you get to the deep culture. Um, so things that you might not be a part of if you're not a part of the culture. So the importance, uh, what it means to be clean or how you solve problems. Um, some of those deeper ingrained ways of thinking that we don't even really always notice in ourselves. Johan, do you have anything to add about this iceberg? I think it's really helpful. So some of some of you started mentioning these deep culture components just in the free discussion component just before. Um, I think it's really helpful to see it how it's on the screen right now because you can sort of think about, oh, expectations. What is my culture of expectations? Um, and that might not be a question that you've ever asked yourself. Um, and so seeing the iceberg like this with some specific aspects of deep culture uh, I think can be a really helpful self-reflection piece. Um, I shared in the chat box that a couple of concepts that just fascinate me is um, your view on raising children um, and how distinctly uh, variant it is across um, across uh, folks who parent, um, as well as um, as the concept of fairness. Like I feel like if I had never met any of you before um, and I got to learn and you shared with me. Um, how you view fairness, I would know you at this really important deep level that would allow us to work more effectively together. Great, thanks for sharing that, Ilana. 
So we have some more discussion questions for you. Feel free to share these in the chat box as well. Um, and we've talked about some of this stuff a little bit. So how do you share your unseen culture with others? You might also right. consider how do you learn about others' um, unseen culture as well. Sorry, go ahead, Johanna. Yeah, well, I was just reflecting on, like, you know, I think we all have a love-hate relationship with webinars, so thanks for being with us today, right? <laughs> Our team at Youth Move works on webinars all the time. We're always on a platform like this. And um, I love to use uh, new different icebreakers to get people to share deeper underlying things about themselves that we can't just see um, see easily uh, so that it doesn't have to be like icebreakers depending on who you're talking to but creating space to talk about the unseen parts um, of our life that are really important in our culture something I love to do good one very applicable we do use that to sort of like tap into um, you know what you might think about different topics that aren't related to work I've also gotten a little braver, I think, Maddie, about just choosing to tell people things about me that might be important. So I recently started a new part of my life and my community that involves working with a whole bunch of people I've never worked with before. And um, some of you know that I love strength finders. Um, and my strength finders really connect to my value and culture. And so I've just emailed everybody. And I was like, hey, I'd like to introduce myself. And I need you to know that these things are really important to me. Um, we didn't feel like we had time to not understand each other. We needed to just be able to work together right away. So feeling a little braver about sharing about your deepness um, without That's great. needing to be asked. I feel like I'm an overshare. Got to hold back sometimes. So we're kind of opposite that way. I think that's a part of your culture, Maddie. <laughs> So Catherine says, the best way I know of to see, to share unseen culture is to have a conversation with the other person. If you bring up parts of your unseen culture, it might make the other person willing to share. That is so true. When you are willing to like open up and be vulnerable or just like offer that, it makes other people more comfortable. It's an excellent way to, um, to be a leader. And you can also, through conversations, sometimes inviting people I know to a family or cultural event. Um, that's excellent. So you can invite them to be a part of your culture um, and see that and interact with people in um, something that might be like a cultural event for them. It's really hard to discover others' unseen culture. It can be an uncomfortable conversation sometimes, but an important one in order to find growth. That's true. Sharing culture is not always, um, sometimes there can be um, an, some discomfort if your cultures are, are very different. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit as well. I'm really grateful for all of you for sharing your wisdom with us and with each other. This is great. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, guys. Um, so we'd also like to hear if you have thoughts about the way that unseen culture affects the way we work to make change, um, and how does it shape you as a leader? We heard from um, Catherine saying that being able to share her culture um, helps others sharing theirs, so that's one way that um, she's a leader with her culture. We sort of slipped a nugget in there on the previous slide and didn't say anything um, about it, but actually the views we hold on leadership, so how each of you define leader and think about how you can be a leader, that's actually a part of your culture, right? So there's this interesting um, you know, reflection point there in how um, who we come from and where we come from really drives and dictates um, our approach to leadership. Absolutely, and how you view yourself as a leader 
Um, also, thanks for sharing that, Johanna. Joseph says, I, want, I always want to be an effective listener in my SOC coalition, trying to implement their ideas and that will get the buy-in. They will be more readily open to work together. So I think what Joseph means is um, if you're able to listen and connect with people, it's easier to get buy-in and actually move those ideas forward, which is so true. It takes such a connection, I feel like, when you're doing community work especially, um, there has to be some sort of like connection between the people that you're working with. Marquisha says, conversations and getting comfortable enough to ask questions about culture, the values that have been instilled in me pour over into whatever I do. Absolutely. So your values is something that you take from your culture. And um, as leaders, you're going to use your values to make decisions. So that's an excellent example, Marquisha. Thanks for sharing. We still have some people typing, and I would love to hear all your guys' thoughts. So let me give it just another second. I think it's important for us to um, create time in our lives to pause and ask ourselves, why do we act the way we act, or how do we work the way we work, or how do we lead the way we lead, um, and sort of have this backwards walk into this is who I am and how um, my culture and values have, um, you know, helped me grow to be me, and that's showing up in my work. Um, I think that's really uh, an important reflection for us, um, and one that takes you have to decide to make conscious time um, to spend to spend reflecting there. Absolutely, that's an excellent point. And your culture can even affect how you manage your own time and how you view your own work. Um, like Johanna said, she values responsibility a lot, and so her calendar is constantly full all the time, and she's always on time to everything. Um, and then, but sometimes if you don't value, like you said, you have to make space to have to value personal care. Um, and sometimes I think that that's just something that comes with growth, and not as much to do with culture. I don't know what do you think, Johanna. Oh, I don't know how you can unwrap culture from anything, <laughs> really. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I know that I know that my um, we keep using me as an example. <laughs> I know that my reflection or um, my resistance to um, spending time on self care um, is seen in my in my family's culture for sure, right? Um, that that's something that I've seen modeled for me. Um, in a multi-generational way, um, and I, I respond from that place. Um, not that change is not possible. <laughs> <laughs> so we also have someone in the chat box saying, because I am an immigrant, sometimes I feel I have no right to express, to express my idea. But then I am remembered that I am a citizen of the world, and I belong to wherever I am at the moment. Absolutely. Uh, yes. You can carry your culture <laughs> with you, and you can also, I found that um, a lot of places you go, you become a part of other cultures as well. Awesome. Thank you all for sharing that with us. That's excellent. Um, so we talked about some of the ways that our culture can influence the way we lead or the way we work towards change. And um, it actually, we have this great letter, we call it the ladder of inference, and it sort of shows that mental process um, going from how we observe data at the bottom um, all the way to taking action at the top. And this ladder, this like steps that you go through, happens really quickly. And sometimes you don't always um, have an awareness of what's happening. But we can be aware of it and, um, and sort of make sure that we are, you know, try to avoid having bias that when we are doing our work for others. So the first step is observing data. This is just sort of taking in information, right? Um, so we all take in a lot of information all the time, and then we select data from the information that's given us to see what's important. Um, so that's this third step, which is adding meaning. 
this is sort of where our culture comes in. We add meaning to it, and then the next step above that is making assumptions. And assumptions come a lot from our beliefs in our culture um, or maybe our past experiences. So you use that information, um, you assign that meaning, and then you draw conclusions. And these things sort of lead to, to, um, to taking action in our work. So it's good to be aware of these things, of this process in ourselves, but also in others. Um, and becoming more aware of that process when it's happening can help us um, make sure that we're sensitive to other people's culture in our work and not let those things take over when we should be focusing on a common goal. Do you have anything to add, Johanna? Um, I'm curious if folks have heard of the ladder of inference. I could just do like a yes, no in the chat. Um, but I think you keyed in on the, on the part that feels most important to me, Maddie, right, is that who we are um, and how our culture and values has shaped us affects these steps many of these steps, right? But it's how we add meaning. And once we add meaning to data, we're affecting our ability and sort of our choice to respond and to act from it, right? And the conclusions we draw. And so, like you said, you we jump the ladder of inference in milliseconds every day, right? Um, but if we were to pause, you know, those first steps um, where we're selecting the data and adding meaning um, are so influenced by our our culture and so affect our outcomes, right? Um, and so building and bringing awareness to that is really, really valuable. Absolutely. Thanks for adding that, Johanna. So this is an illustration to sort of demonstrate um, how things can look different. The same thing can look different to two different people, depending on where you're coming from. Um, so these people are looking at this object, this impossible object, and one person says it's three, and the other person says it's four, because that's what it appears to them. Um, it's important to remember that you can't really be certain of everything if you haven't looked at all the perspectives of something. Um, so having those conversations, like some people have mentioned today, being able to just engage people in a respectful way and learn their perspective can make a really big difference. And um, take away some of maybe the friction in work when we're working with others. I love this picture, Maddie, and it gives me a total headache at the same time. <laughs> I know, I can't look at it for too long. <laughs> I would be there, and I would just be there, I'm so right and you're wrong. Um, yeah, I would be one of those people arguing. <laughs> or like the, um, have you heard of the, like the, the metaphor of like the elephant, where these people are wearing blindfolds and they're all touching an elephant, but it feels different to all of them because um, they're all standing in different places. Yes, that's a great story. So we have, one of the ways that we can sort of become aware of any like biases that we have in ourselves um, is to use this tool that is an implicit bias test. Um, so before we go any further into this, I'm going to let Johanna explain sort of what the um, what the implicit bias test purpose is um, inside of a context. Sure. So um, this is an online. This is an opportunity. You could take an online test to determine um, your uh, own implicit bias. Um, so implicit bias is your subconscious bias. So what we're not conscious of, right? Um, and it is a part of actually a nationwide research study. Um, so it's a free assessment. It's a set of assessments or tests that you can take online um, if you go to Project Implicit. And you do make a profile for yourself. You register uh, to, and, and they do that because they're organizing and tracking who's taking the, the implicit bias um, test and then our responses in the aggregate, so all of our responses together. Um, and when you get on this site, you can choose um, the topic or the particular bias that you want to explore with yourself. Um, I don't know if they still do this, but uh, when, when I took it, I like the practice was, do I have a bias for Coca-Cola or for Pepsi products, right? Um, and then from there, you can explore um, all of these other important biases that show up in our work. Um, 
And I've said self-reflection a few times. I mean, this is just a really key opportunity for you to reflect and become aware of um, biases that you may hold, right? And when we're aware of something that is subconscious, we bring it into our consciousness. And once we're aware of it, it's something we can work with um, and change and mold um, if, if we um, want, uh, want to. Awesome. Thanks for explaining that. Um, yeah, so this is a really great opportunity, and I've actually, they have different ones like um, explore if there's a certain topic that you're interested in. So I definitely recommend this, and it's actually pretty fun. It's like a time test, and you go through and you choose. Um, it's like really simple. They have like a really simple screen, and you choose things, and um, at the end of it, it sort of gives you an analysis. So it's really interesting. It's interesting for yourself if you want to share it with people that you work with. Um, it's really a wonderful tool, so we definitely recommend it. And Maddie, you're totally right in that it's simple to use. I think it can be uh, overwhelming to approach. So I'll just be really honest about one. I wanted to take an implicit bias test on um, my thoughts about young people uh, as compared to old people, and if I had a bias one way or the other. And I work for an organization that has youth in the title. And I spend every day um, advocating for youth voice at tables. And I really didn't want to take that association test um, because I was worried the results would um, make me aware of some bias I had um, sort of against young people that I wasn't aware of. Um, so I had to really, like, gear up and, and take it. Spoiler alert, I was not surprised by the results. I did not need to be worried. <laughs> um, but I do, I just say that to say that this digs, this digs into your core, right, um, about what you um, think you believe uh, versus what you uh, subconsciously are responding to. Yeah, absolutely. And I think subconscious is really the term um, that this tool sort of pulls out. So thank you for saying that. Cool. So all of that, just sort of in summation, is um, this idea that all of those things give us a filter through our work and for the world, really. Um, and it just sort of means that like we don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. And um, we see things where we're coming from and how we interpret them um, and what that means to us. So it's good to be aware of these things when you're going into work um, that involves a lot of people and their well-being. So Johanna, did you have anything you want to add before I let you take over? No, this is great. Thanks for covering all that with us. Awesome. And thank you guys so much for participating in the discussion. That was excellent. All right. We're going to transition. It's a little bit of a transition sort of into the next um, section. So what, what um, Maddie has been talking to us about, about our culture and how we jump up the ladder of inference um, and about our uh, implicit biases is, you know, how we show up in the work. Um, and then I'm going to shift us into the conversation about how we choose to lead in the work, right? And so um, here I think we'll get a little bit more tangible in terms of things that you can use um, in, in your day-to-day. -day. Um, so my question for you all, it's a rhetorical question, although feel free to start typing in the chat box if you feel called, is who is actively um, experiencing change? right now is are you a part of a change initiative at work are you a part of a change in your community is something in your family changing um, and I would guess that every one of us is experiencing change somewhere in our life right now um, and I want everyone to just think about that and think about what change makes you feel what sort of emotions um, come up for you when I'm asking you to think about change? So usually people say frustration, anxiety, worry, excitement, opportunity. Um, all of those words and wherever you are on the spectrum are intense emotions. Um, so change and experiencing change affects us at a really deep emotional level. 
um, if you're in this work to improve um, systems for youth and young adults in the future, right, you're asking for complex change to be made in our country. Um, and so we're going to use a tool um, called Managing Complex Change to break down um, uh, some of what you might be experiencing. So um, this is from someone much smarter than me um, uh, from um, a, a couple of decades ago, although it still is really relevant. Um, this came into my world when I was able to attend the System of Care Primer, so essentially the initial training um, to learn what System of Care is. Um, and it helped me a lot in thinking about the change within system of care. Um, and now it helps me think about change uh, in all of the work that I do, um, and mostly in developing uh, youth-run programs and organizations. So, um, so what I want to share with you is the essential components of change. So I'm going to introduce five components to you. And those, fit two, those five things, one, two, three, four, and five, are going to um, be the components that sort of equal change, right? So I'm going to uh, actually move the slides on your slide so you can see this. So the first component is vision. We've already talked about that today, right? What's our goal? Where are we going? What's the long game? Um, so vision is the first component um, to a change process. The second component is skills. Do you have the capacity to make the change happen, right? We've already talked about that this work doesn't happen alone. This is does your team, does your community have the skills um, in order to make this change? The third component is incentives. Is everyone at the table, your um, fellow staff members, um, youth leaders on the advisory council with you, uh, representatives from partner organizations, do they all get something out of participating, right? Um, sometimes when we say incentive, I think we think about like party favors. <laughs> um, and while I am incentivized by like glittery keychains and pizza, um, I really mean something bigger here, right? Does everyone see themselves winning or gaining something out of participation? So if you are bringing five organizations together to collaborate on something, do all five of the organizations get to move their own missions forward? Are they incentivized um, to participate? So that third component is incentives. The fourth component is resources. Do you have what you need to make change happen, right? Do you have the money? Does everyone have the time? Um, do we have the um, community space that we need? Are the, are the building block ingredients, the resource ingredients available? The, and the fifth component of change is an action plan. Do you have a strategy? <laughs> Does everybody know the next five steps um, that they need to take in order to make change? And if you have these five components, um, you can make change, right? These are the components that set you up for success. So um, if you're like me, you're like, yeah, 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 that's good. I get it. Um, but I actually am really frustrated by the fact that we're trying to change and we're not changing. We're doing something else, but it doesn't feel forward moving or like change. Um, and so I'm going to break down what happens when one of these components is missing, right? So what if you have a great community group, right? You have all the skills to do your work. You have incentives. Everybody wants to be there. You have all the resources. You just got a million dollars. You can do whatever you want with it. And you have the best plan with the, the most uh, micromanaged, beautiful steps, and all the to-do list makers can check off all their steps. Um, but you're missing vision. What, what these four components together, skills, incentives, resources, and action plan create is not change. When they're alone and there is no vision, they create confusion. So when I was asking you guys a little bit earlier to think about change that you're a part of, if what you felt was, oh, I'm so confused in the work, a reflection point is, 
Do we all share the same vision? Do we all know where we're going, what our long game is? Um, similarly, if we look at a team that has four components, this team has vision, but they don't have the skill set they need in order to make change. They have all of the other ingredients. We end up in a state of anxiety, right? Um, I resonate with this one a lot. <laughs> um, we know where we're going. We all want to be here. We, we have our grant money, and we have a plan, and yet I am literally worried about what we're doing every single day, right? The idea of change just brings anxiety. That often stems from missing this component of do we have the skills we need in order to accomplish change. I'm hoping someone is going to like type really loud in the chat box if this does not make sense. <laughs> um, so you can see what's happening here, right? I'm sort of taking away one of the components um, in, in each of these scenarios. So the next, um, the next scenario is we have vision and skills and resources and action plan, but no one feels incentivized to come. Nobody ordered us pizza, right? What happens then? We experience resistance. So maybe we bring 17 partner organizations together, we write a vision statement, and we've got our grant writer and our evaluator and our coordinators and our providers, um, and everybody's coming to the table with resources, um, and we make a really great plan. But really underlying it all, everybody's sort of wondering, why did I bother coming? What do I get out of participation? How is this better for my organization? Um, and, and that's this scenario of missing the incentive. And what happens in our change initiative is that we experience resistance. The next scenario is you have vision, skills, incentives, and action plan, but you don't have the resources you need. Has anyone experienced this? We've got the vision and the plan, but there's no money, right? or nobody has the time because everybody's a volunteer, right? Nobody has the time to dedicate. Then we sit in a place of frustration. The next um, scenario that I'm going to show is what happens if you have vision, skills, incentives, resources, and no plan. And if this is your scenario with these components, um, you're going to feel like you're on a treadmill. Everybody wakes up every day, they're doing good work, they're using their skills, they're maximizing their research, but you, resources, but you can't tell that you're going anywhere or if you're making any progress, um, and you feel like you're on a treadmill. Um, so you guys are typing in the chat box, it sounds like this does make sense to you. Um, if you are like Joseph and you're working on a strategic plan, you can use this concept in two ways right? You can show your team the words in red on the right-hand side, the change, confusion, anxiety, resistance, frustration, and treadmill, and ask them what they're feeling, right? As a group, where are we? Um, and if it turns out that everyone is frustrated, you can work backwards to say, let's have a real conversation about the resources we have and don't have, right? Um, and maybe what's happening is we have a vision that's too big for the resources we have, right? So let's center around either spending more time um, finding resources and leveraging resources or spend some time to adjust back uh, to, to the size of your resource pool. So you can, you can do it that way, figure out where your team is on the red, on the red side, or you can use it as a checklist, right? Do we have vision? What are the skills we have here amongst our team members? Are we missing anything? Is everybody incentivized? Do we have all the resources we need? Um, and do we have an action plan that actually works for everybody? Um, so you can do, you can do that uh, either way. Um, and so this has just been really helpful for me as I think about um, how much work we do at Youth Move to help um, youth programs sort of dream and plan to become their own organizations or how we help youth coordinators build out their youth engagement strategic plan throughout a system of care grant, um, knowing that we are in a complex change initiative um, 
can be helpful, right, to start. And then knowing what we have and don't have in terms of these components is really valuable. Um, I think Gary's helped us out. You can totally download this slide deck um, from the handout pod. Uh, and I would love um, if there was a way for you guys to use, use this in the future. Um, are there any questions about this process or any of these slides? All right, Maddie, anything that you'd like to add in this before we move forward? Um, no, I do love this matrix, though. It's really, really helpful when you're working, um, especially with youth and family advocates, um, to like sort of like get an idea that, that maybe these feelings aren't just, like it's not just you and it's not unreasonable that there's a reason that people are feeling frustrated. Um, so I think that can be really validating for some people. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think there's so much power in naming the challenge, right? Mm -hmm. um, just to be able to say, hey, dude, we don't know, we don't have the skills. We don't know how to do what we're being asked to do, right? And we can try, but we're going to be stuck here until we figure out how to add to our team or we get a little bit of de development as individuals. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm really excited to hear if any of you feel like you identify in, in one of these um, different states or stages. Um, if change, confusion, anxiety, resistance, frustration, or the treadmill. Um, that's my dreaded place. Don't get me stuck on the treadmill without a plan. Um, uh, feel free to share about that. And um, and then I guess, uh, you know, Brandon and Joseph, I think you've answered this question in terms of, like, identifying that missing ingredient is valuable, right, in being able to move forward. So, okay, cool. Um, managing complex change and understanding the states you may or may not be in is uh, tool number one for you guys to take home and use in your work. All right. Um, I want to transition to talk about um, another uh, sort of framework, I would call it a framework, that might be, I hope, would be very helpful to you in um, your plans and your communities. Um, and that is the concept of the golden circle. Um, and so this is Simon, this is Simon Sinek's work. Um, he has a couple um, sort of infamous uh, TED Talks. So some of you may have um, heard of uh, the Golden Circle or Simon's work, um, and if so, let me know in the chat box. If you haven't, I'm going to tell you this. I am going to do, a, I'm not going to do as fine a job as Simon Sinek does in delivering his own idea. Um, I think that the um, TED Talk that's linked on your screen, How Great Leaders Inspire Action, is well worth the maybe 14 minutes of time that it takes to watch it. Um, so totally, uh, totally check out that. Um, TED Talk as a follow-up. Um, so Simon, um, Simon's work in this particular TED Talk and um, a lot of work that he's written about as well is this idea of the golden circle. Um, and his premise uh, is that we oftentimes start, um, we start our work by describing what we do, right? Um, we build this, how many of you have written an elevator speech <laughs> for your work on system of care or within your youth council, right? Um, I need you to be able to say in 90 seconds what, what we do. Um, and if you look across um, leaders of really big, successful organizations and you analyze um, their communication style about their work, we're talking about Steve Jobs at Apple, right? Um, Steve Jobs actually never talked about what Apple did, right, making computers. Um, Steve Jobs always started at the other end of this equation, um, and this is really the premise of the golden circle, that the other end of this equation is to start with the why. Um, so this is, a, this is a communication strategy that has ripple effects in everything you do as a leader. 
Um, so when somebody asks you what you do, you respond with why you do it, right? And so um, when you're thinking about how to develop your why, there's a couple of things to think about. Um, your why is your purpose, why you exist. We ask um, our chapter network this all the time. What is the reason you exist? Why, um, what is that purpose you're feeling? And your why statement, um, why you exist, is explaining your purpose. Um, your why statement also explains your cause, right? And it also explains your belief. Um, so at Youth Move, we believe that youth voice and listening to young people will change the way our social systems work. And we exist to get youth voice to the decision-making tables. Um, Underline all of that is our belief that, that youth are the change agents, right? Youth are the leadership and the expertise we need right now. So starting um, to describe your work and communicating your work from the why um, is actually a message uh, that, that links to the way human brains work as we hear a narrative story, right, and how we respond to narrative story. So starting your communication with why you exist, explaining your purpose, your cause, and your belief causes the individual you're talking to to care. And once someone cares, you can have this conversation about how we do our work, right, um, and what we actually do. Uh, but if we, if we start with the what we do, the widgets we move around, the thing we produce, the thing we try to sell, um, we oftentimes lose our opportunity to truly communicate and to build buy-in um, with our audience. So starting from our why lets us encourage everyone to buy in and care. We can build out our circle moving into how we do the work and what we do. Sometimes people call this um, an inside-out communication strategy, right? So really talking about the heart of your work, um, the stuff people can't see, right? Um, maybe not what's on your website or what you um, traditionally were saying in your elevator speech, but hopefully we change that, right? Um, this this inside-out of saying, let's tell you about our heart and our guts and really why we're in this work. Um, and then if you're still interested, we'll talk to you about how we do our work. And if you're still interested, we'll, we'll even tell you what we do. Um, so this concept is the golden circle. Um, I'm wondering if, if this resonates with anybody. Does this make sense? Or could you see yourself talking about um, and communicating about your work um, in this way? Give everybody a pause <laughs> for a minute so we can chat. Um, and if you've got something. All right. Go typers. I'll let, it looks like Joseph and Brandon are both typing. I'll let them type in, and then we can um, talk a little bit about how you might use this um, in, your, in your work. I know that I it's always need, um, easier to describe to people, like, the goal of – working with youth than it is to describe what we actually do. It's so much easier to say, uh -huh. you know, we want to improve programs than it is to say we act as liaisons and work to get people involved in boards and, things. And you know, that takes so much longer. <laughs> yeah, I find myself refra reframing all the time. I mean, people ask me, what do, what do you, Johanna, do for a job? And I'm like, well, I mean, I push a lot of paper. <laughs> um, but I don't really want to talk to you about that. I want to talk about why we exist and why um, I'm a part of this larger movement um, to, to sort of infuse youth voice everywhere. 
And it's so much more interesting to pitch your goal to people than it is to pitch the work. You know, when you're looking for involvement, it's easier to, like, start with the end, you know, than it is to say, oh, look at all this exciting paperwork you'll get to push. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, you should go to paperwork school before you start this job. That's, that's not a good thing to say. Um, okay, Joseph is sharing. Um, I always go into a meeting asking the question, what can I do to improve your services and getting others to work on what you are trying to do to help these programs or access resources? Cool. So that question, Joseph, I'm going to cycle back a, back a section. That question of what can I do, right, is a really important question when you're thinking about change, right? Where do you fit in that puzzle? What, what, where does your skill set and your resources um, fit into change work? So that's actually a really good segue <laughs> from the change conversation to our conversation now of starting with a why. I love that. Okay. Um, Brandon says that I think that it's easy to get burned out sometimes if you focus on just the what. So true. Um, it goes along with the vision that we talked about in the matrix, right? If we remind ourselves of the way, we can inspire us to keep going. Oh, my gosh, so true, right? Um, so if I – I'm going to keep using Apple as, like, a bad example, but I think we can all get it, Right. If Apple spent a lot of time advertising how many earbuds they sold every year, um, I would be like, I don't care, right? And if I worked at Apple, I wouldn't actually be particularly motivated to commit more to the organization because I know more widgets, in this case earbuds, are being sold, right? Um, but if you talk to me about um, how we're changing how people communicate and use technology and build relationships and interface with the world around um, around them, and you can help me see how I'm making that happen, how I'm a part of that. That's like such um, such a core visioning question and argument um, that sort of builds people's buy-in. Um, the widgets and the what and the data numbers, I think, do burn us out, Brandon. Yeah, that's a really good insight. And if any of you are trying to raise money, talking about the what is not particularly effective in in making that sort of appeal, uh, particularly for for financial resources. Okay, cool. All right, so everybody has homework, right? You're going to go use. Um, the managing complex ch change stages in your work, right? And you're going to watch how great leaders inspire action uh, as a TED Talk. A group homework assignment and an individual homework assignment. Um, and Simon Sinek has a couple of other TED Talks that so you may, you know, sort of follow in the TED Talk uh, whole and keep watching or listening to them. Um, and I'm sure that you will enjoy them. So they come recommended. Um, so I want to take Brandon's um, segue that you offered us um, to talk a little bit about this burnout question, right? So um, when we were preparing content for today's session, we know that many of you are um, really amazing active leaders in your community right now. Um, and I'm sorry, guys. I totally <laughs> – I think I was on mute there for a second. Um, I'm back. Someone's going to give me the nod. They can hear me. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so this idea that we um, – it is all too easy to um, get burnt out doing the really important work that we're doing in our community, right? So each of you are, um, are utilizing your leadership capacities um, on a daily basis. And we want to give you a few tools to use, to put in your toolbox. Um, and it's really hard to not have a conversation in this um, about something about self-care, right? Particularly because I know one thing we all have in common on today's webinar is that we're in the helping world, right? We're working every day to help others find their voices, connect to services, build connections, find friendship, providing support to each other. Um, and in order to do all of that, 
you know, the, the metaphor we use is that you're pouring from your cup into other people's cups. Um, and if you never find a way to fill your own cup back up, um, eventually your cup is going to run dry and we won't be able to fully give or support um, uh, what we need to give to, to others. And so um, we're going to use the last few minutes of our webinar today before we get to some wrap-up things um, to talk about how affirmations um, might play into um, your own personal care for yourself um, as a leader or an advocate or a peer in this world. Um, so I'm wondering if people are familiar with affirmations, um, and particularly if you use any self-affirmations already, um, can you let me know in, in the chat box? Um, just like a quick, yes, I use affirmations, or um, no, I don't. Yeah, all right, Jules does. Awesome. Oh, yay. Oh, I feel like I'm, like, in with my people. Okay, awesome. Yeah, like several okay. people use affirmations. <laughs> awesome. Okay, cool. All right, great. Well, maybe I can do this. Um, I'll do a quick overview for those of you that don't already use affirmations, and then we can all learn learn together. Okay, cool. So um, I'll start us off with this um, quote. Um, One impact of working in community is that we might feel that the need to create justice for others supersedes our own self-care. Make a list of statements that we are told or that we tell ourselves that stop us from our self-care practices. Um, and this is um, a quote, it's actually a, an introductory into a set of activities that, um, that are part of a self-care guide. It's it's a, the radical art of self-care for um, youth and young adults. And it is um, one of the resources that we're sharing with you. Um, it's a workbook. It has a ton of different activities that you can do or you can share with youth in your community. Um, and this, is, this intro to the affirmation uh, exercise comes from that. Okay, so an affirmation is um, a statement that you develop um, about yourself um, that you can utilize on a regular basis um, as a reminder to center who you are. Um, and affirmations are positive and strength-based. We're affirming ourselves, right? And you can affirm, um, you can affirm yourself as a, as a leader, as a peer provider, as a youth advocate, as a human. Um, and so there are a couple of ways to determine um, an affirmation for you. Um, someone is saying this in the chat box, and I totally agree. I'm always looking for new affirmations and good ideas other people have, because um, it's a little hard to pull one up on a blank piece of paper for myself. Um, one good thing to do is to um, ask um, a question, right, and then to develop a response for yourself. So the examples on the screen are, who do you think you are? And the response to that question could become an affirmation. So who do you think you are? I am someone. I am important. I am worthy of respect, care, and love. And so you'll note that the responses here are um, affirming. They're positive. Um, oftentimes, they're universal, right? Um, so there is something universally helpful um, that you can say about yourself every day to affirm who you are. Um, sometimes we can develop uh, affirmation statements from negative statements, right? So if you're in, um, if you've ever had someone say something to you that feels like a negative statement, and this example here um, on the screen is so true to my own life, um, so my sister, who I love dearly, will say things like, you are so emotional, right? With that connotation that maybe it's not a good thing. Um, and developing an affirmation to respond to that 
um, that is strength-based, positive, forward-thinking, like, I am really glad that I have feelings, right? Um, that's a really good affirmation to have in your core to say out loud um, should you ever encounter someone telling you or for you even feeling yourself that you're being highly emotional. Your response is, I'm glad I have feelings. So affirmations can be used, um, so many people use them like as a daily routine. So when you get up in the morning and you're brushing your teeth and you look in the mirror, you might always say an affirmation to yourself. Um, other people, um, like myself, will use an affirmation before going into a difficult conversation. So if I know I'm going to a table um, or to uh, into a relationship where the conversation might not stay positive, um, I will take a deep breath, ground my feet, say my affirmation, and then enter the room to be a part of that. Um, other people will write their affirmations literally everywhere on 17 sticky notes, right? <laughs> so they're there always. <laughs> and you don't have to sort of call upon yourself to remember them or use them, um, but you're just sort of stumbling on them and you read them out loud every time you see them. Um, okay, lots of excitement about affirmation in the chat box. Um, does anyone have an affirmation that they might be willing to share that they use on a regular basis? Ooh, someone's typing. This is exciting. <laughs> so one of the things um, I think it's really valuable, and we've had some um, youth leaders lead affirmation writing sessions for us, where um, we get together and we just spend a good 30 minutes writing affirmations for ourselves. Um, and I really just want to hear what you guys are sharing, and then I have a couple of examples we'll share um, for ap affirmations you could say for yourself and adopt as your own, um, or affirmations that you can offer to someone else, which I think can be really powerful. Oh, Joseph, I love this. I know myself, right? I know myself. That is an amazing affirmation that is, tr there is truth to you um, in that statement. I love that. So I, I know myself, and no one will label me negatively in what I believe and what I am trying to do in the community. That's great. Okay, I love that. Um, Melissa shares, I am capable. So true. I think simple affirmations like that, I am capable, are, are so healthy for us, right? Um, and so important that we hear on a daily basis. Okay, Marquisha, you sound like you thought about this a little bit. Okay, I am enough just as I am. I am where I am supposed to be at this moment. Oh, that's really great. So Marquisha, you've got one there that's really about you as an individual and then about the context and environment that you're in. That's great. So I do, um, I do suggest people steer away from things that feel affirming but come from an external source. Um, so this isn't true for everybody, but I, again, I'll use myself as an example. Um, you know, I will see, um, you know, someone writing an affirmation and they'll write something like, I am beautiful. Um, if I woke up every day and my affirmation was, I am beautiful, I just have to tell you that, like, some days I don't own that. And I have sort of a, an inability to not feel external judgment with that type of statement, right? Um, so I would suggest um, thinking about your humanness in your affirmation. And a reframe of that might be, I feel beautiful, right? Um, or or something, um, something a little bit more about what's sort of coming from inside you, um, rather than a measure that our society, for better or worse, holds some sort of spectrum that we can be judged upon. Um, and I think that that helps us keep um, in this positive affirmation space. Okay, this is awesome. I can't save the world, and that is okay. Stephanie, I need that one. <laughs> I know who I am, and I know what I'm capable of. Oh, I love it. 
okay, this is so great. You guys don't even need any of these examples that I was thinking of. Um, uh, let's see. Maybe I'll just share two um, that I that I really like. Um, I am special and unique is one that's really valuable. Um, and I forgive myself and others. So those are a couple from um, my example sheet. Um, and then has anyone used positive affirmations to share with someone else? Um, so this can be particularly helpful if you're leading an activity to set affirmations, right? And someone goes, I, I can't think of anything. There's nothing positive for me to say about myself. I don't believe anything good about myself. Um, I can't do this. Um, there are so many good positive affirmations that you can share with others, right? Um, and so examples of those are, you are good enough. You are courageous. Your life is a glorious adventure. You make a difference. And so as I'm reading these, you know, I can see people's faces come up for me of people who in my life need to hear these things, right? And that um, maybe I can step out of my box and offer this affirmation into, into their life. Um, and it might just be at, at the moment that they need it. Um, but this, this, this practice of affirming others and affirming ourselves is a very conscious way for us to fill our own cup while we are approaching and managing and living in complex change, right? Um, and living and leading and working and helping others um, and building and changing uh, the future for the better. Um, things like an affirmation practice can be really uh, valuable in filling your cup up. Oh, we've got one more good one, Melissa, thank you. I trust my own intuition. I love that. OK. Um, Madeline, do you have anything to add in terms of affirmations or self-care? Um, well, I didn't share my affirmation earlier because mine's a little strange, mm -hmm. but I will share it since you've asked. Um, I had a friend one time who I was talking to about how upset I was for feeling inadequate. And he said that. Well, first he said, you are adequate, and then he said, let me start over. He said, you're not adequate, and neither am I, and neither is anyone. And it just, like, was a reminder that, like, I don't have to be perfect, and I don't have to be everything all the time, um, that there's nobody that's perfect, and that's okay, too, and I can still be my best self. Oh, thank you for sharing. I And I think you should all own your own affirmation, right? Um, there's no extra points for having an affirmation like somebody else's, right? <laughs> um, and if you're like Maddie, like you, you own that affirmation, right? And it means something really important to you. It makes it, it makes it the right fit. Okay, cool. So um, we're adding a third piece of homework. Right? So you're going to explore complex change, you're going to listen to Simon Sinek's Golden Circle TED Talk, and you're going to practice an affirmation. Right? Um, my my strengths-based reframe of homework is that we should call it thought work, and maybe you'll be a little more into it. Um, so thought work to, to carry with you today. Um, gosh, uh, Maddie, we had too many ideas to talk about today and too many resources, so I think we're just going to send folks out the door with them, right? Um, I don't know if we have time to talk about everything. Um, in your file pod, you have um, a link to download these slides, and if you download all these slides, the hyperlinks will work, and you can access resources in the TED Talk and the implicit tests, et cetera, online. Um, there are a few resources that we don't have on an online source. We just had PDFs of them, and those are available in the file um, download pod as well. Um, all of them focused really around um, strengthening your work as youth advocates and youth leaders, um, touching on a bunch of different things, where you are in your work, bringing youth onto boards, how to deepen youth-adult partnerships, um, one here on self-care, 
uh, how to create space and really listen to young adults. So it's sort of a little bit like um, Maddie and Johanna's favorite resources of the week roll call, I feel like. <laughs> um, Maddie, anything specific you want to call attention to on this particular list or other um, thought work for the road? Um, well, the the youth voice tip sheet is awesome. It's sort of just like a one page. I think it might be sides. Um, but these are great to sort of like have at your meetings if you have new people that come through. This is like some information. Um, I found that really helpful. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and thanks for thanks for sharing it with this whole group. So um, we'll leave you to download um, uh, download those resources, check out the hyperlinks. Um, we are here. Um, we're available as resources to all of you in the work that you're doing. Um, we're an email, phone call, or text message away. Um, numbers and emails on the screen right now. Um, and we would love to support you in um, your own leadership work um, in developing and building um, youth programs and organizations um, and supporting youth engagement work in whatever way makes sense. So um, reach out if you have questions. Um, we're a part of the TA Network Collaborative, so there's a multitude of um, expertise and resources that we can call upon um, based on your requests. So don't be strangers. Um, there is a, um, a feedback form um, that will come up when you close out of this webinar, or you can click on it already. It's in the chat box. Um, we can only change um, and improve sessions like this if you tell us what you liked and what you hated about it. So um, I'm all for honest feedback. We'd love to hear how to make webinars um, a little bit more um, usable and helpful for you and your work. Um, so go ahead and use that link. Uh, share with us what you think about today's session. Um, Gary, Maddie, anything else to offer before we wrap up today? Feel good. All right. Thanks, everybody. Go back uh, to doing amazing work in your communities, and we will see you on the next Direct Connect. Thanks for joining us, everyone. See you next time.